Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is Gustav, and I work, work at a company called Jayway in Malmö, Sweden. And uh, roughly for the last year or so, I've been very interested in these two topics, uh, Hype Media APIs and Adaptive Web Design. So super briefly, Hype Media APIs is about avoiding putting application logic in your API clients. And Adaptive Web Design is a good way to cope with the multi-device web. So these two technologies or ideas are solutions to different problems. But what I found is that they actually kind of work very nice together. You can com combine them in an interesting way. So first of all, I'm going to show you a demo uh, of a Kanban board that I built using HTML Hypermedia API, APIs and adap adaptive web design. So the Kanban board has two simple rules. Uh, the first rule is that you're only allowed to go one step at a time. So you're not allowed to sheet to, to go from the backlog to done directly. You have to follow each step. And then, it, and then the second rule is that if an item is in the done state, you're only allowed it to move back to the working state because you have to test it again, verify it. OK? So let's fire up the demo. Yeah. So nothing, nothing funny here, nothing uh, expect, uh, no surprises here. You can move things back and forth um, here. As you see, some buttons are bigger than others, indicating that this is kind of the next primary action for this, this item. So we're moving things forward, typically in, in, in Kanban, uh, and not so much backwards. OK. So this is kind of enough for a simple Kanban board. But I wanted to have one more thing. Uh, like I want to focus on doing only one thing, one kind of, one kind of task, task, so to say. So if I choose to work, I get a read-only view of the Kanban board here, and just the thing that I'm doing right now. And this means that I can work, and this is ready for verified. And then I have nothing to do. So I pull more work by, by this drop-down here. Uh, and boom, the board is updated. And I have some more work to do. And yeah. So this is kind of the de desktop web perspective on the, on the, de on the application. But if you, we can kind of simulate a mobile web by zooming in. And here you have, well, not exactly as it would look like on a, on a cell phone, because the cell phone is typically more, much more wider. Uh, but you get a hint of that the design is much more simple, simpler. Uh, it's not a board. It's more uh, a collection of columns here. Um, and if we go to the work, uh, working uh, states, we don't have the read-only version of the board anymore. We just have a more, more simple view, right? Because we have so, a much more limited amount of space. Um, and if you zoom out again, here it is. OK? So, how much of these, these things are being done with JavaScript, you might ask? So I have a, this uh, Chromium running in a, where I've disabled JavaScript. So you'll see that uh, the navigation is actually not being seen here. Uh, if, you go to, if you go there, you, f you find this uh, oddly looking view. Also, in the working state here, uh, you don't have a read-only version of the board anymore. Uh, but you can still do things. Um, and, and you can just move things back and forth here as well. OK. So, so this is running on one, on one instance of Rails. And on another port, another instance of Rails, 
I have a REST server. I have um, an API. So this is an HTML hypermedia API. And as you see, it just looks like a really ugly old website. Um, but you can still do a lot of things, exactly the same things as uh, you could in this perspective. So actually, this is very uh, similar to the mobile, the mobile web view or with JavaScript disabled. So what I did is, yeah, it's, there's no JavaScript, no CSS, no, nothing here, just plain HTML. And so how do you consume this, this API? Do you just like go, and go to a, a test server and see what responses are, are there or not? Uh, no, because you need to have some form of documentation. So if you, so you, if you open source, open the source, um, you can go to the rel profile, and here you have a, doc a documentation of the media type. So you can see that I'm using uh, microformats two, uh, which is based on HTML five. Well, my, my API is based on HTML5. And yeah, there's some, yeah, what you could expect in a spec. And there are some interesting class names that you might be interested in, in if you are developing against this API. There are some form, uh, form names, form element names. And there are some, some standard and some non standard relationships. Um, so, so I, I built a, a Ruby client that consumes this HTML hot media API um, in like 80 lines of Ruby. Um, okay, so this is not very, maybe you can dim the lights. <laughs> can you see anything here? Yes, no? What? How do you do that? OK, if I just zoom in, maybe it's, it's better. Uh, OK, so basically what you see here is a console version of, of this, this view here. But yeah, in text only. So what you can do is that you, for example, you see the verify uh, column here. You can go from verify, the V, and move that to done. And you can move the thing in done, or you can just type the word back to working, like that. OK? So there's a lot of st stuff in my demo, um, both web, mobile, and desktop, and an API, and a client consuming that API. So how does this all fit together, uh, you might ask? So let's go back to the slides here. And let's back up a few levels. So if you have these kind of rules, like I had on, in my, my Kanban board, like for specific states of a particular entity, you are allowed to do certain things. And on, on, in, other type, in other states, you are not allowed to do some things. Uh, if you have those kind of rules, or if you have some rules depending on which state the user is in, like authorization rules. Um, some users are not allowed to do all the things, right? Or maybe you have a combination of these two uh, con concepts, like for a particular uh, state of an item, only an, an admin user are, is allowed to delete or move it, right? So, so the, these rules are, of course, in the will be implemented in the API because they want to enforce that these rules are being followed. But then these rules would also need to be in, if you, in all the clients consuming this API because how would, how would a user know what they're allowed to do or not, right? So, uh, and so you have duplicated, duplicated code of the rules or actually about the processes um, both in the API and all the clients. And that, I think, is kind of a bad idea, because code duplication is a, is a, bad, is a bad thing, uh, both because it's ineffective and also very hard to change. You have to 
change in all these places and kind of fork, fork stories to each, to, if you control the clients, of, of course, to, to uh, make, make different persons or teams implement, uh, make, implement a change on, in each client. So it would be much better if the rules were, were only in one place, a centralized place in the API. Uh, now the only problem is that we have to find a way to communicate those rules to the clients. Otherwise, it's worthless, right? And the only way that I know of that can do that is REST, and more specifically, REST level 3, using hypermedia controls. So, so what is the hypermedia constraint in, uh, in the RESTful architecture style? Uh, John Moore puts this very elegantly, saying, you do stuff by reading pages, and then either follow links or submit forms. And if you think about it, it's, it's exactly the same way as we humans surf the web, browse the web. We get a page, and with our eyes and brain, we interpret what, what's on the screen, and then we either follow a link or submit a form. That's what we do on, for a page. And the only challenge for, us, for developers is to instruct the machines to do that to kind of learn them how to see what, what, what links to be followed, what forms to be submitted, and when, when to ask the, the user for, for input, right? And there's a good, very good blog post by Jan Moore uh, called Using HTML as the Media Type for uh, your API. And I really like that idea, uh, because uh, use, uh, using HTML, uh, because HTML has a lot of happy media controls is actually one of the most competent have media, uh, media types out there. Also, it's very old. It's like 20 years old, and it's been standardized over and over again. And like, how many here doesn't know HTML? Or maybe how many people know here, know HTML here? Yeah. So that's basically the whole room. And I mean, there's different levels. Uh, you, can perfect, you can write very crappy HTML, but at least there's a lot, of, it's a ton of information on the in internet on how good, what, what HTML is, and how you, there's a lot of things you can learn. Um, so it's like ubiquitous knowledge uh, in some way. Uh, which is something that you couldn't really say about JSON based media types because they are very new, and there's not a lot, so there's not a lot a lot of information on these media types. Um, there's also good tooling support uh, for HTML. For example, you have this thing called a browser, so you can actually visualize the responses being sent from the server using, yeah, graphically, which, which was, of course, the origin, original intent of HTML in the first place. But there's a nice side effect of, of having that, because you are, for example, for testers or operations persons, they are able to use your API without writing any other tool than just consuming it in a browser, using that, that crappy-looking um, API, the old, old website look and feel. Um, so from that perspective, it's a very accessible thing, HTML, an HTML media API. And then on the, on the server side or server side development perspective, you have tons of different template engines in various platforms, and you also have like code, code editor support, syntax highlighting, and also some kind of semantic rule checking that some elements are perhaps not allowed in other elements. Different editors uh, have dis different powers there. And there's also a thing that you don't get currently today with JSON-based media type, types. Uh, so finally, I think that HTML is really great for learning about hypermedia. So even if you don't, for some reason, think that HTML as a media type is a good fit for you, I think it's a good way to just approaching the hypermedia thing from the server side and on the client side. Um, and then, you, it's very, like I said, you can just click around and see what happens, and then can to see how can I teach a machine to consume my API, and how, what information should I, should I add, it's like metadata, which metadata should I add. Um, and then you can go back to, uh, to, your, to, your, to one of your applications and see, okay, I need this hyper, these kind of, these number of hypermedia controls. 
what JSON-based meta type has the thing that I'm looking for, right? So, um, if you use HTML as the meta type, you need, oh, sorry, a quick interlude here. I think JSON is very okay, it's super fine. Uh, I don't, I'm not a JSON hater. Um, it's very interesting, very exciting that we have a lot of different JSON-based meta types uh, being invented, yeah, at a quite, quite nice rate currently. Um, but, uh, and I think that choice is good, like the more the merrier, but choice is also hard. You have a lot of things to choose from, and you don't really know which, which one suits your problem the best. Um, but JSON, based, JSON is okay. Um, I just want to say that. Um, and the kind of the debate between HTML versus JSON as a media type, I think it's a bit, bit wrong or, yeah, not very productive. I think that the, the key, the main barrier to entry is actually not either JSON or, or HTML. It's like writing hypermedia aware clients and writing um, hypermed good hypermedia APIs. So that's kind of harshing. Parsing and traversing are easy problems, right? So, if you're using HTML as the meta type for your API, you need some kind of, you need some way of uh, exposing semantics. Uh, you need a, a, a semantical layer on top of HTML. And one way to do that is to use microformats. And uh, there's a new version uh, called microformats 2. Um, how many here know about microformats? So kind of half, okay. So microformats 1 had this problem that you couldn't, you couldn't see if, if a particular, particular class uh, name was for semantic information or some styling information or for JavaScript or both or the purpose of that class. So microformats 2 solved that problem with having this convention of a character and a dash saying that this is semantical information. And I just want to be clear that I'm using kind of a microformats 2 style so my, my microformats are not published anywhere, They're, or actually they publish in, the, in some way in my, uh, my media type documentation. Uh, but I'm mainly going for the style here of microformats too. So here you see a, an, an item on the Kanban kind of board. An H denotes the, that it's kind of an entity, uh, H item. And then you have a P name, P status, P description. And then we might zoom in on the P forms uh, here. So here you see uh, two, uh, two buttons, basically, two forms. Uh, the first form tells you that if you submit this form uh, using the method post to this URL, you will move this item to the backlog. And the second form is saying that, yeah, if you submit the form, you will move this item to the verified state, and this is the next that's the next logical state for this item to be in, moving things forward. Um, so the alternative is that this information ends up in a PDF document somewhere. And that's not very, very good. It's better to, I think, I think it's better to have this information in the data, uh, kind of conveying meta, metadata, instead of having uh, this kind of information in a PDF. And that's basically all, all I had to say about hypermedia. I have some other things to I want to tell you. So, what I found during this last year is that HTML Hive Media APIs and uh, Mobile First have a lot of things in common. I think they kind of share the some common common design values uh, and maybe some kind of philosophy, deeper philosophy behind them. Um, for example, that um, you should. Uh, you should be aware of the amount of data you're sending, obviously. Uh, if you compare a mobile page with a desktop page, typically you have a lot of more data on a desktop page than a mobile page, traditionally. Um, but in, a, in, in an HTML hot media API, or hot media, an API at all, you want to kind of be more focused because it's rude to send things that are necessary, right? So mobile first is one way of doing that is so there's a value here that if the user wanted to see something, they wanted to read a blog post, they wanted to submit a tweet, they wanted to do something, 
the, the only thing that you should show, uh, the, the main thing that you should show is that thing, the primary content or the primary service. And all other things are secondary. It's, it's not useful um, so much. So at, if you remember, I had the navigation link um, in the demo. Here, it just says navigation, right? So, and then when, when, you have, when you have decided on the primary content for a particular view, then you, you can, on, in design time or, and in runtime, say, OK, this navigation link here, I think it's pretty good to have that included on every, on every view. Uh, so with AJAX, and this is a technique called aggressive enhancement, with AJAX, you take the URL for a link, fetch it with AJAX, and then replace the link with the whole or a part of that content. Um, and then, for example, as you saw, uh, if you have a wider screen, you can, you can make a decision that, OK, now we have some space. I want to load in some more content. Uh, so I load in a read-only version of, of the board. And I mean, if you have a, a really big amount of space, then you will end up reading, re, uh, following a lot of links. And this is, of course, decisions that the client is, is taking. But eventually, you will end up with something that's a desktop website. So you optimize for, for the desktop web. But still, I mean, it's based on this mobile-first uh, aggressive enhancement idea. So, and, and this, I think the, it was Scott Yale who kind of coined that term, aggressive enhancement. So, uh, an aggressive enhancement is a part of adaptive web design. So, maybe you, have no, maybe you know about responsive web design. How many here knows about that? Half again, okay. Um, so, responsive web design is probably the most famous technique within the adaptive web design umbrella, uh, so to say. And there's a lot of things to learn in adaptive web design. Um, and there's a lot of things happening, and it's kind of a huge topic. But it's based on a really simple principle called progressive enhancement, uh, which is something that you might agree on or may not agree on. Um, and, but I just think it's a good sound web design principle that you should base basic web development on. And not everybody agrees, and there's a debate uh, been going on for several years about this. Uh, but I kind of, this is kind of my default mode. And sometimes you, you have to make compromises, but I really like progressive enhancement because it's accessible for all devices out there, supporting all devices that has a web browser inside of them. And then you can optimize for different platforms and devices. Um, being economical about it. So, so what I found is that the web and the API can be exactly the same thing. And so, so HTML hyper media APIs and mobile first are really very, very similar things. And then with mobile first, you can adapt that um, to support, to, to optimize for different platforms, for example, or bigger screens, or all the different uh, parameters that you have. So basically, this means that you can combine HTML Hyper Media APIs and adaptive web design, and having the same, the same code, the same application, being both a web application and an API, and exactly the same code. So what will this, this mean in, in practice? Well, so again, it's the same code for your web and your API. And yes, it's the same templates for the web and the API. And so now, OK, so they're the same. But then you need to split them, right? Because it would be nice if you wanted to, at some point in time, split the solution. Because then your API clients would consume your dub 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 site. And you wouldn't, you, it would be very hard to separate them. So, at least do a duplicated DNS entry pointing two URLs to the, to the same IP address. Or like, like I did, uh, have two separate instances running on different ports. Um, and then the rest is just the same. And what you can do that is that you can optimize for both perspectives, 
or for either perspective. So for example, in the API perspective, as you saw, I removed I remove script tags and CSS tags. And that's basically just an if, if web, then don't show this. Um, and that if web is based on, is a function based on, the, on some part or the whole of the URL. And also in, on the web perspective, it might be that you don't want to have all these all this links or, or information that you have in the API perspective. Maybe you have some admin, admin links that should only, only be used from the API perspective. Or maybe you have some batch operations that's not, not, not really good to have in a, in a website, uh, just being accessed by, from, from clients. Um, so that's, that's a way out. Like, there can be some differences, but probably you will, you will, you will fix those uh, with just separating uh, in the templates themselves. This, this means that you have a much tighter code base and uh, that it probably will be easier to work with. Yeah. So an example here is that I want to change the application, add a state and two transitions. So I add an archive state and two transitions. So let's do that. Um, so here's the workflow. Is that okay? And as you see, this workflow is basically, yeah, this one and this one, the same thing. So we add an archive transition here. And from the archive state, you are allowed to go back to done. OK. So let's see how this Ruby client behaves on this change. So here you have an archive state, and you can move, uh, let's see here. And you can move things from done to archive, and then from archive back to done. And of course, the the change will be visible here as well, and, and here too, because it's the same code. Yeah. So you can imagine if we, if we did this change and the, the clients were regular clients, not happy, happy media aware, I would need to add a use case or a story for each client, uh, and that would, yeah, and probably, it would be, it would, um, so you, at some point in time, you would have different rules in different clients because not, not all people update their iPhone or Android apps at the same time. So, and, so, and that is a kind of hard problem to solve, um, synchronizing these changes. And so this is much, much, much easier. Yeah. So, just a quick summary here of what I wanted to say to you today. So basically, the, the, the core idea of my talk is that HTML hypermedia APIs and mobile first are very, very similar. And of course, it ties in. It depends on if you think that HTML is a good media type for your application, then you should think about the possibility of actually using that as a mobile first web page. Otherwise, you, I mean, yeah, then everything falls. Uh, and then with mobile first, you can use that with, um, with adaptive web design to enhance, optimize for different, different kinds of clients, desktop browsers or different yeah, other, uh, other browsers. So if you want to read more about hypermedia uh, and about REST and about adaptive web design, I could recommend uh, these books. There's, there are probably a few more out there right now. Um, and on the web, there's a guy called Brad Frost who has a lot of good material on adaptive web design. And also, yeah, Nicholas Sackas talks a lot about progressive enhancement. And uh, he's a JavaScript guy, but he's really, he's, yeah, good talks about how you might want to limit the amount of JavaScript in your applications. Uh, and then you have something called resource-oriented client architecture 
that has a lot of good requirements and guidelines on how to write good, uh, good resource-oriented clients. Yeah. So uh, this the code is on, up on GitHub. Uh, there are demos running at uh, at Heroku, both on the web and the API perspective, and the slides will be are on GitHub and will be, will be published on SlideShare yeah, in a few minutes, or in a few hours at least. So uh, thank you very much for attending uh, and listening to my talk. It's great to be here. Uh, my Twitter handle is here if you want to ask any questions. And I think we have some time for questions yeah. now as well. Yeah, we can, like, we can do it, so please. Uh, so you said that might be a good idea to use HTML as an API because it's standardized and everybody knows HTML. On some degree, it's true that it's standardized because we have the tags because you know it's pretty much similar to XML, to XML. But people don't represent their data using HTML in a standardized way, so it's very hard to say, "I want the most important part of the article or the article body." People, you know, nest that thing into inside lots of divs. So this will be. Do you think that? We should do something to, you know, make people to standardize more, like you know, using maybe HTML5 articles or, you know, to have that kind of part more standardized. Yeah. And the second question is, do you think that the 17-inch tablet is a mobile device? Uh, what? what? A 17-inch tablet okay. is a mobile device. Um, so the fir the first, um, I will answer the second question question first. If I think that a 17-inch tablet is a mobile device, so. Um, because it's easier to answer, I think. Um, the, yeah, the, the interesting thing about mobile first and adaptive web design is that the whole thing, the whole difference between mobile and desktop just breaks. So you, instead you have all these different kind of clients, and you have, so you might have bigger screens, and they have all these kind of different capabilities. So I don't, so yeah, a 17 inch tablet, I mean, how big is this? Yeah. OK, so it's like a computer screen. So yeah, that's a mobile device, because you can carry it around. And, that's, that's, and probably uh, you can use it with Wi-Fi wi and, uh, and a cellular. And this means that you can have all these use cases, of, like standing in line, uh, waiting for something, doing a tweet or whatever. Um, but I mean, it's not a mobile. It's not a smartphone. It's not a small device. What? Yeah, I mean, it's... I didn't quite get that. Yeah, the, the, I think you mean that the web is, is like... It's supporting every every device, yes. wow. right? But the thing is that not all people ag actually agree on that. that if you, you, it, you, some people think that you shouldn't care about, for example, um, having your website work at for uh, like uh, game consoles. You know, game consoles can have web browsers too, and Kindle can have a web browser in it, in it, and that experience is currently really really bad for a lot of web pages. But I have, I have that use case when I'm lying in bed and I want to see something and I read in my Kindle, I just want to access something and everything breaks. Prob and both because, also because Kindle web browser is very bad. Okay, so would I design a, a web page for a seven inch device if it's mo mobile or desktop. Yeah. So, uh, so let's I try to be more clear here. N e neither, not, not mobile and not desktop, because you have this thing, a lot of things in between. And if you want to, if that's an important target audience or important device for you, then you should consider optimizing uh, for that particular tablet. Um, but at least you should support it, right? And then that can mean, mean different things. Um, and I mean, you, you can either just go for the, the full-blown desktop page, but, may, but then suddenly you realize that, well, there's this problem with 
I, I'm not using a mouse, I'm using touch. So that, then you, have, if you can optimize for that. That's kind of an adaptive web design problem. It's kind of a huge topic and a lot of things that you need to think about. So I want you to ask, answer the first question as well. Like, how, or if we should standardize on HTML for APIs. Um, I think that microformats is um, a good, good way of dealing with that. There's some, um, something called RDF and RDF Lite as well, which I, I, th I think microformats is easier. But, so, like, when, you, when you're writing JavaScript code, uh, traversing DOM, try to find things, you want to not. You want to be careful with the specific, how specific you are in your selectors, right? And that would be exact same thing, consuming an HTML IP media API. You want to be kind of general in your selectors, not depending on the, you know, if there's a div, maybe there's a div there. I don't care. I just, yeah. Um, and that's a kind of nice thing because with with JSON, it's very hard to have a like, query over JSON uh, tree. But so I don't know. I don't think we need a standard of style, but we need we need to think more about microformats and and start using that. I have a, another API related question. The promise of the hypermedia API is that you don't need to put any intelligence into the clients. You just have this really fat API, and then anytime the API changes, the clients immediately uh, change accordingly. You, you, and you need to have a that. different intelligence. What, what's that, what's right, that, okay, so th this is probably just me not understanding how this works in practice, but let's say you have this Kanban application and you, you decide to add a print button to each Kanban, Kanban card, uh, which would add a new link to it. Now, in this case, your iPhone app, your Android app, and your website, as well as your mobile edition of your website would have to be updated to have a little print icon next to the print button. So. It, I don't really see the, the, the full advantage of having hypermedia if you have to change every single client anyway. Okay. Um, I mean, a print, print thing, I mean, that's... I, I don't think it's kind of... It's not really a, so, a good so example, I think. In HTML, we add images with an A tag, right? So you would be including another affordance with the image in the response, and then the client would know how to display that. So just like you added a new state and the client picked it up, if you added a new tag with the image for the print button, it would pick it up. That's the short answer. Anyway, I don't want to answer full. Like, does that make sense to you? Do you think that's a good answer? Yeah, but the problem is that on, on an iPhone, there would, wouldn't be any way exactly. to print, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, right. So do, don't you think that's a problem, too, on, a, on, the, on the web? Well, to be, to be honest, I, I think the, the, the fact that the API already has links in my opinion, is such a small advantage that I would never optimize for that. So I would use either REST or Apache Thrift and, and not worry about you know, having like actual links in the API page because I just don't see the benefit. Okay, so maybe, I mean, it's some, maybe, maybe you have an application where you won't benefit from Hypermedia and then you shouldn't do it. So, so it's easy, that's easy. Um, but you, you might want to, I mean, how much documentation does your application have? Uh, how much do you have to read in, like, on the web or PDF to consume your API? And I think it's, it's, it's much more tighter context. I mean, it's more local if, that, if you had this, this information in, in the entities, the, action, the, the forms and the links, instead of need, need it to go to the, to the PDF. The, uh, that's, that's sort of another thing, that the forms and the links will be in one language, but the, I, the application will have to be translated to every single language that it supports. And so basically, in practice, you won't be keeping any of that HTML because you'll be swapping it out for the Korean translation in your iOS application. And so you're going to have to rewrite all that HTML anyway and then translate it to whatever your particular platform supports. So I just don't see the benefit, but maybe okay. that's just me. Maybe we can talk later. Um, yeah. Okay. So maybe final question. Hi. Uh, I assume from the name Hypermedia, HTML Hypermedia API is pretty based on the fact that you have HTML. But nowadays, the web uh, representation layer is getting more diverse. So you have like SVG, Canvas, OpenGL, 
if my app heavy rely on these, can I still take advantage of these hypermedia API, or it's kind of separate issue? Yeah, that's a good good uh, point. That you you might have things uh, like the SVG tag that it doesn't make sense in in the API. Um, so then you could you could have, for example, what's the, what's the SVG doing? Is it like just an image, or is it? So maybe you could have you can replace that with an image for the API perspective. Uh, and if you have, I mean, if you have a, for example, a calendar tag, which is interactive in the future, um, I mean, what would that mean from the API perspective? So that, that's, that's a problem if you're, you, might, you really need to think about not blending in so many presentational things in the API, API perspective. Um, but still, you have, the, you have a way to, to ignore, to filter out those things. If you, even if you have the same code, I think. But you need to think about that. Okay, thank you, Gustav. Yeah, thanks for being here. Pleasure.